them, we invite them to church, we accompany them, and we rejoice with them as they see victory in their life. That was the Bible challenge. And you heard that in, in her interpretation. And I just want to bring that to our attention that God was speaking to us. Amen? I, uh, I love that song, Mercy Seat, but I've heard it so many times when I've listened to services from when they had the revival in Brownsville. But every time I hear it, I hear Steve Hill's voice. He was the evangelist there. And I hear him calling, Run to Jesus! Run to Jesus! Run to Jesus! He goes, Give me all the money. Run to Jesus! During that song playing, I just I see that in my in my mind's eye, people running, and just there were people from all over the world that went to those services and people just running to the altar as that song played. And, and I love that song because the best thing we can do is run to the mercy seat. Amen? Yeah. Run to the mercy seat. That's where we need to be. Able to be. First Corinthians chapter 2. And uh, I'm on verse 1, and I'm just going to kind of walk through that a little bit this, this evening and, and do a little bit of teaching. I've got 5,000 e pens. Probably only two of them work. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Praise his name. And uh, let me read those verses again. It says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now I mentioned this morning we, we got started on verse 1, and, and I got kind of tied up with came not with excellency of speech. And I described what excellency of speech was and, and why Paul really didn't want to come with excellency of speech. We see here that in the first Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 2 that he's not wanting to bring forth the wisdom of this world. And he's not trying to show how learned he is or tell great stories or be the funniest preacher in town. He's not trying to come in and, and speak out of some authority. But if we notice in this passage, it talks about the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me read that to you again because that's key to understanding this whole passage here. And my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And that tells us, like I said, what kind of church we want to be. We want to be a church that has what? Demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And when we're looking for a church, we, what kind of church we want to look for? One that has demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And we're going to dig into this a little bit, hopefully, tonight and get far enough that we understand why. That their faith should stand in the power of God and not in the wisdom of men. We don't want our faith in the wisdom of men. And, and we went through that a little bit this morning that, you know, we can put our faith or our trust and we can look to a lot of different things. We can look to education and put our trust in that. Or, you know, we can look to the government and put our trust in that. Or we went through several different examples where people put their trust in themselves. And, and I share, you know, some people put their trust in luck. And they, they go to the gambling boat and they, their trust is that they're going to get lucky and win money. And, you know, or they're going to go to Las Vegas and win money. And I always share with people, you know, when you go to Las Vegas, just walk out there and stand there and look around. And ask yourself a simple question. How did they pay for all those buildings? Mm -hmm. By you winning or by you losing? It's a pretty simple thing to figure out, isn't it? By, by people losing money is how they build all those buildings. They didn't build those buildings and all those massive conceals by people winning money. So, I mean, so there's many things that people can put their trust in. And when we're looking at this, and Paul is preaching here at the Church of Corinthians, and he's saying, you know, I'm not coming with enticing words, I'm not coming with the world's wisdom, but I've come here to preach to you and for you to see a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit and to see the Word of God demonstrated so that you will place your faith in the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the wisdom of men. The wisdom of men, I, I shared some of that this morning, you know, we can look around the world, can't we, and we get a good understanding about the wisdom of mankind. I mean, what are the results of mankind's wisdom? We have a lot of wars, don't we? We have a lot of crime, don't we? We have, we have a lot of political corruption, don't we? I mean, we can go on down the line. We have racism, and we have economic division, and, and just everything evil that you can think of, we have it as a result of mankind's wisdom. So it's obviously not working very well, is it? So maybe Paul understood something here. Maybe the Word of God's onto something here. And maybe we need to see the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need to pursue. And that's what we need to be after. And that's what we need to be looking for.
looking for in church. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. It's that simple, beloved, but we're going to look at this. Declaring unto you, verse 1 again, declaring unto you the testimony of God. The testimony of God. And, and a lot of times we can just jump over these verses and jump over these scriptures without stopping and considering what's he talking about. The testimony of God. That word testimony there means something evidential. Evidence given to be testified a testimony or a witness. For example, if a person goes into court and I don't know if you've ever done that and you go into court and you get up on the witness stand and, and you testify about something and and you give a, a, you know, you witness something and you give your, 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 your report of what took place and what happened. You're presenting evidence. You're presenting facts of what took place. And they gather all this information to try to make a decision in that court. They're looking at evidence and what you can say. I mean, we can look at a, you can go visit a place and, and come back from that place and you can testify and give us a report of that place and, and share with us what you witnessed at, at that place. That can be a testimony and you can testify of that. Or maybe you can meet some person and, and maybe some real famous person and come back and everybody's interested. What were they like? Or what were they like in person? And all these different questions. And you can testify or give witness of what that person was like. And some facts about some of that person. And let's talk to you here about the testimony of God. Paul came and he had a testimony of the things of God. The Bible talks about in the book of Thessalonians that there's a people who, who received that testimony, believed that testimony, and as a result of that, it, it talks about them being raptured out of the, this world and, and when Christ comes. And we see a lot of different things in the scriptures talking about the testimony of God. And uh, it, it's, it's interesting to understand it. We're going to look at that just a little bit tonight to understand, beloved, that, that everybody who comes in and if they're going to preach the Word of God, they need to have a testimony. If they're going to stand up and, and teach the Word of God, they, they need to have a testimony. I mean, they need to have some understanding there. They need to have, so to speak, some credentials if you want to look at it that way. And it is not necessarily the credentials that the world has. Paul was saying, I'm not coming to you with my credentials of the wisdom of this world. Paul was a very educated man. He was a very learned man. And the way I understand it, it would be similar to in the time we live, say you had a, a, an education, a Harvard degree or Oxford degree or some, some uh, elite college. The, the education that he had was tremendous. But he's saying, I'm laying all of that down. I'm not coming with that. I'm coming for a testimony of what God has done. I'm coming here to bring a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit so that this church can begin to place their faith in the power of God and not in the wisdom of men. And you'll find that all through 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. That's what it is. It's a dividing line separating the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God. The wisdom of man and the power of God. And the Apostle Paul is laying all of this down and testifying of what God can do. One definition of that I wanted to mention real quick. Refers to the fact besides proclaiming the truths of the gospel had borne witness to the power of these truths. Mainly such having to do especially with the preacher's personal experience. So he wasn't coming and bringing historical facts. He wasn't coming and just bringing academic facts. But he was coming with a, to preach the word of God, and he had with that a testimony, and he had with that the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now go to Hebrews chapter 6, and like I said, I'm just going to walk you through a few different scriptures. And I'm showing you why this is important. One of the things that I've watched over the years in Christians' lives People will listen to anybody. And they'll take advice from almost anybody. And, and, and I, I don't want to break anybody's heart. And, and you know, people have accused me at times of not listening to people. Or, you know, I talked to you, Pastor, and you didn't listen to me. And it's not a knock, but I'm very careful on advice that I take. And I listen to everybody. But what I immediately do is what you tell me, I feel through the Word of God. I don't care who it is, whether it's one of you guys. I don't care if it's, you know, the, the most well-known preacher in the land. Whatever advice they come to me with, one of the first things I do is I filter it through the Word of God. Automatically. And I don't care who it is. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, then, I, then I'm not heeding it. I'm not listening to it. 
And that's just a simple thing because there's a lot of people out there who want to give you advice. There's a lot of people out there who want to give you their opinion. There's a lot of people out there who will want to give you counsel. I personally, at times, when, when I'm going through a battle or a struggle and I'm fighting a, a faith fight, I may not share it with a lot of people. There are times I probably don't share it with anybody. For the simple reason I'm not looking for human counsel, I just need to hear from God. And I need to know what God's Word says. And then there's a good place for godly counsel, don't get me wrong. But we've got to be very careful, according to the Word of God, on who we heed and who we follow. And the Apostle Paul had a testimony here of how the power of God was working in his life. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to, to, to take advice or be led by somebody who's not seeing it manifest in their life. I don't want somebody come to me and say, you know, Pastor, this is how you really see God move in this area of your life, and, and yet it's not moving in his life or her life. That wouldn't make any sense. I don't want to learn how to play the piano from somebody who can't play the piano. You know, if somebody wants to, to, to teach you something, I want them to have, to, to have some demonstration of their ability to do that. Right. So Hebrews chapter 6, I'm building all that up to this one verse here. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. That you be not slothful, that means don't be lazy, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we're not to be slothful, but we're to follow those or heed the counsel of those who through faith and patience are inherit the promises of God. So if somebody is not seeing the promises of God manifest in their life, then that's somebody that as a believer we shouldn't heed. I'm looking at me. I've been getting these looks all day today, all morning this morning. Hallelujah! Paul is what Paul is trying to do here as he's, in, he's coming into this church and beginning to minister. He's drawing his atten our attention to something that he has a testimony of what God has done in his life. He's trying to draw their attention that, hey, what you need to look at is the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And what the book of Hebrews is telling us here, if somebody is not walking in it, then don't follow them. If they're not seeing the promises of God manifest in their life, then don't follow them. It's like I said, Paul is in some ways kind of laying out his credentials. And people like to say, well, I've got my credentials here as a minister. Well, the credentials that God is talking about here is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The credentials that God is talking about here is a demonstration of the power of God. The credentials that Paul is talking about here is a testimony of what God has done in his life. And what the book of Hebrews is telling us here, unless somebody has that evident in their life, then they're not somebody that we should follow. You see, one of the areas, I, I see two areas, and I probably, I probably shared this before. The two areas that I see Christians get in trouble more often than any other area is one, they listen to everybody. The other is they listen to nobody. I mean, most people who crash and burn, that I've talked, but I've watched it, that's what's going on in their life. You go to the empty chair where the Word of God says this, but it don't matter. So and so said this, and so and so said that, and so and so said that, and so and so said that. So and 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 so don't know anything about God. But I think they're right. The other side of the coin is you go somebody and say, you know, I, I, I'm really concerned about how you're going in life and, and it doesn't look like you're lining up with the Word of God here. And here's what the Word says. Wait, 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 wait. I know I don't need to hear that. I hear the voice of God. I don't need anybody's counsel. Get back. Get back. Oh. You see, we, we, we've got to heed other people, and we've got to heed other people that God has put in our life, but we've got to be careful who they are because the Word of God plainly tells us there that if they're not inheriting the promises of this Word through faith and patience, then don't listen to them. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. If they don't got a testimony, then why should we listen to them? If they don't got the power of God being demonstrated, why should we listen to them? I just think on that for a minute. I can tell you're all in need. You remember the story about the 
Moses sent out the 12 spies to spy out the promised land. And they went in and they spied it out. And they came back and they had a testimony, didn't they? Ten of them had a testimony. Oh my goodness, the Amalekites are there. Oh my goodness, the Hittites are there. Oh my goodness, the Amorites are there. Oh my goodness, I see the giants in the land. And we can't do anything. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. Oh, what was us? There was Joshua and Caleb, and they had a different spirit about them. And then, wait a second. Let's just delight ourselves in the Lord, and He will give us the land that He's already promised to us. And we know what happened that those who followed the ten and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and perished. Joshua and Caleb went into the promised land. Now, let me ask you a question. Which one of that group should you have followed? Probably Joshua and Caleb. But the majority listened to the other people and followed them and went that way. In other words, this scripture would have been real good for them to have. Joshua and Caleb are walking with God. Joshua and Caleb are seeing the power of God in their life. Joshua and Caleb are probably the ones we should follow because Joshua and Caleb are going to go to the promised land. Had a testimony. Paul had a testimony. I would say it's probably this, simple. We've got to be careful who we heed and who we follow. Because they're going to affect us that we're going to, in some sense, become what they are. And I don't mean them to be harsh, but lukewarm pastors produce lukewarm churches. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And if we're following somebody who, who, who's not walking in the power of God, so Paul comes in and he introduces himself. I've got a testimony from God. I've got evidence of what God is doing. I'm going to bring this church to the place where I'm going to get you to focus on Christ and Him crucified and absolutely nothing else. And I'm going to bring this church to the place where you're going to see the demonstration of the power of God. I'm going to bring this church to the place where your faith will no longer be in the wisdom of men, but it's going to be in the wisdom and the power of God. Amen. And I've got a testimony of how that has happened. I've got a testimony of the sick being healed. I've got a testimony of the dead being raised. You see, that was Paul's credentials. That was his ordination. You see, there's evidence to the kingdom of God. And we may not see it with our hands. We may not see it with our, we don't see it with our hands. We don't see nothing with our hands, do we? I just blind people do. Let me rephrase that. We don't see anything with our eyes. We, as far as the kingdom of God necessarily, we see the fruit of it. Jesus described it as being like the wind. You see the wind, you don't see the wind, do you? You see the effects of the wind, the results of the wind. But you don't see the wind itself. Do you feel the wind? But you see, you say, well, Pastor, have you seen the kingdom of God with your eyes? No, but I've seen the evidence of it. What are you talking about? I've seen my own life and I've had the experience of being born again. That's evidence. And I can testify to that. I've experienced being baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's evidence and I can testify to that. I've been healed physically, miraculously, numerous times. I've experienced that, and I can testify to that. And go on down the line. I, I've seen other people be born again, and I've seen their lives be transformed by the power of God. I, I've seen that, and I can testify to that. I, I've seen other people be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I've seen that happen. I've seen the evidence of that. I, I've seen people be physically and miraculously healed. I, I've seen that happen. I can see evidence of that. I've seen people prosper in the things of God. I, I've seen evidence of that, and I, and I can testify to that. I, I, I've seen people delivered from demons and from the power of hell. And I've seen evidence of that. I can testify. Of that. You see, I don't see the kingdom of God, and you don't see the kingdom of God, beloved, but we see the evidence of the kingdom of God. 
You see, the city might not see the kingdom of God, but they should see the evidence of the kingdom of God. They should see people who are born again and their lives are transformed. And see, you remember so and so, he was crazy and aloof, but look, he's walking in his right mind now. Remember so and so, he used to be lame, and now he's walking up and down the streets. Remember so and so, he used to be blind, and now he sees and deaf, and now he hears. Remember so and so, they lived in poverty, but suddenly they started walking in the kingdom of God, and God began to prosper them and to bless them. And look at what's happening in their life now. You see, we can see evidence and testify to what the kingdom of God is manifesting and the power of God is doing and how the power of God is manifesting. We should see evidence of the kingdom of God and have a testimony of the power of God and a demonstration of the Holy Spirit so we can testify and be a witness for the kingdom of God, beloved. As a church, we should have a demonstration of the spirit and the power of God and have evidence that testifies to the kingdom of God and the glory of God. That's what Paul's talking about. That's what Paul's talking about. You see, remember the, the person in Acts 3 that was healed, that gave beautiful? Peter and John were going to pray, and he was there begging alms and silver and gold, have I none, but what I have I give unto you, wise up and walk in the name of Jesus. A little bit later, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the powers that be kind of called him in court. They had this little, little trial they set up on their half. And you know what the problem was they had? Was that that, that, that gentleman who was laying but, but standing right in front of them healed. And one of them said that basically in Acts chapter 4 that right there he is healed. What can we say about it? How can we refute what's taking place? They couldn't argue the point. They couldn't say it wasn't real. Right there he is. There was evidence standing in front of them. So they didn't told them not to do it anymore. When Legions was set free, there were people who witnessed that and went and told everybody. And almost the entire city came out to, to witness what had taken place and see what had happened. And they had an odd reaction. They asked Jesus to leave because Jesus had set the, the demoniac free and it made them nervous. The demoniac didn't make them nervous, but Jesus said he can free them. They said, will you please leave? People are odd sometimes. I'm sorry, but people are the oddest things. But you know what? There was evidence right there in front of all those people. That, look at him. He's sitting there in his right mind and eating like a normal person. This is the one who used to howl in the cemetery and cut himself up and bless and change it. Now he's right there transformed before our very eyes. There was evidence. There was a testimony of the kingdom of God. You see, I've often preached this passage, and, and, and I've always liked to preach it backwards, so I'm preaching it forwards today. But I'd like to preach it backwards, because look at verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 again. Hallelujah! 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 5 is a result of Paul's effort. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Well, that's what we want, don't we? Yes. That's what we want to accomplish, don't we? Yes. But we got to go backwards to get there. First of all, he says, my speech and my preaching in verse 4 was not with enticing words, but in the man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power. Before we get people's faith in the power of God, we've got to have a demonstration of the power of God. So if we don't have a demonstration, how can we expect people to have their faith in it? That's what the scripture says. Verse 3. For everybody who said, I'm always nervous when I stand up to try to preach, if you hear from my apostle Paul, you're in good company. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trouble. Remember, the Holy Ghost don't show up, I'm in trouble. Because I'm preaching demonstration. But you see, to get all of that, we've got to get back to verse 2, because this is the source of it. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Before Paul could get to that place, he had to lay everything else down. He had to lay down his education. He had to lay down his achievements. And he had to lay everything else on the line and say, God, I'm going to trust in you and you alone. I'm going to trust in Christ and Him crucified and that alone. And I'm going to go forth there. I'm going to go into that church. 
I'm going to proclaim nothing but Christ and Him crucified. And I'm going to trust that that is sufficient. I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit will move. I'm going to trust that people will say, people will be healed. I'm going to trust that people will be delivered. I'm going to trust that God's going to show up. And He's standing there in fear and trembling, the Almighty Paul. Yes. Oh, Lord, if you don't show up. If you don't come in your power. But you see, we've got to go backwards to get to the place to where we see the demonstration. Or get to the place where we see the faith and the, and the power of God. We've got to have the demonstration of the power of God and have the demonstration of the power of God. We've got to be determined to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. I have decided. Hallelujah. We can sing right now, couldn't we? That word determined is interesting. For I resolve to know nothing, to be acquainted with nothing, to make a display of the knowledge of nothing, and to be conscious of nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I stand before you completely bare with nothing but Christ and Him crucified, Paul was saying. And I encourage you to put all your trust in Him and believe that He is sufficient for every need in the church. Yeah. For everybody who's lost, I hold up Christ Jesus. For everybody who's sick, I hold up Christ Jesus. Everybody who's in bondage, I hold up Christ Jesus. Yeah. He is sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. But we like to display our knowledge, don't we? Yeah. We have to act like we know a lot. I know you guys have never been there, but I'm going to tell you some funny stories about other people who have been there. Uh, sometimes I have to have a real sense of humor on my job. And sometimes people are funny, and especially men. Here's a scenario that's hilarious. If you guys have ever done this, please don't be offended. The guy who's got some girl, especially kind of the wannabe girl, you know, his wannabe girlfriend, and she's going to buy a car, and he wants to go and make sure she don't get taken advantage of. So they come on the car lot, there I am, I hide it. And he goes into this field for 20 minutes, tell me everything he knows about cars, and how he knows all about the car buying process, and all of this stuff, because he's trying to impress her. <laughs> She don't know he don't know what he's talking about. She's like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I'm saying, dude, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> so I'm just nice. The best one was the guy who spent all at least 20 minutes telling me he used to be a mechanic, he works on cars. The, the, the best ones are, I used to sell cars myself. I know how this business works. And with all this stuff, he gave him the keys to go test drive the car. He goes and gets in it. Trying to start and it won't start. He comes back and says, This car won't start. And I walk over and I got in it and I fired it right up. He says, Well, why wouldn't that start? I said, Because it's a standard and you have to push a clutch in before you start. <laughs> <laughs>
for rain. Tell you how much I know about cars in front of my wonderful girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't often go well when guys do that, I'll be honest with you. It doesn't often go well. You'd be surprised how often that happens. They leave, the girl comes back by herself and says, Thank God, can I buy a car now? <laughs> <laughs> All the time, trust me. More often than not, that's what happens. Says that guy's such a jerk because he wants to argue everything and debate everything. He knows nothing and she just wants to get rid of him so she can buy a car. <laughs> so, guys, relax, okay? Don't act like you know everything about cars and take somebody's life. Galatians chapter 3. Hallelujah! This is an amazing verse. When I first understood what the scripture said, I was just, I was really floored by it. Oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Now listen to that very closely. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Now it almost sounds there like Paul is saying that Jesus was crucified in front of the Galatians. What's he talking about there? What's he talking about there? What does he mean by that phrase, evidently set forth, crucified among you? There was evidence. He was set forth among you. He was crucified among you. Let me give you the best I can an understanding of what it's saying there. Right before your very eyes. This is not me. This is out of the Amplified Translation. Jesus Christ the Messiah was openly and graphically set forth and portrayed as crucified. Years ago as I was studying this verse, I, I dug into some about the meaning of that Greek phrase there. And what that Greek phrase is actually saying there, that the Holy Spirit had made it so real when Paul was preaching that message that it became so evident to those in the church in Galatia, it was as if they could visibly see Christ crucified right before them. The Holy Spirit has a job to reveal Jesus. The Holy Spirit has a job to open our eyes to see Jesus and to see Christ in Him. And the Apostle Paul at the church in Galatia was preaching Christ and him crucified under such an anointing that it was like he was being crucified right before their very eyes. It was like they could see it. He was revealing that to them. We look into something that I want to go back to for just a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And out of all of this, this is one of the key points that I really think we need to grasp. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. And this is why I think, to some degree, we don't always see the demonstration of the power of God that we should anticipate. It's not that we need to always do more stuff. You know, we might say, well, we need to pray for it. We need to do this. And all that's great. But we've got to be careful in this area. You see, Paul had a commission from God to not only preach, but to preach in a specific way. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So why he's being so careful here and so determined to proclaim nothing but Christ being crucified, he realizes that if he adds the wisdom of mankind's wisdom to that, then he's going to make the cross of Christ of none effect. Because people are going to be looking at his wisdom. People are going to be looking at his knowledge. People are going to be looking at his excellency of speech. People are going to be looking at his enticing words. And get their eyes off of Christ and Him crucified. And as a result of looking at worldly wisdom, they're going to rob the power of Christ and Him crucified away from it. That word means empty. I used the illustration this morning 
that uh, picked on Zachary that he could go get me a can of uh, Arizona tea with honey and ginseng. And I said, I like those and bring it to me. But before he brings it to me, he pours it out and brings me the empty can. It's empty. It's void of, of any purpose or any value. And that's what that's talking about there. It, it, it's talking about we could, we could add stuff to it and empty the cross of its power. You see, I use the example that it's not God's will that any should perish. But yet, we know that Jesus died for all men. But there's all kinds of people who have robbed the cross of its power because the cross has the power to save them, but because of their unbelief and not heeding it, if they made it of none effect. There's all kinds of people who, who the cross is sufficient for their healing, but they've made it of none effect because they've added stuff to it and taken stuff away. All kinds of people who brought the, the, the cross of its power to baptize in the Holy Spirit because they've taken that away or added stuff to that. You see, if we just add the wisdom of men, the doctrines of men to the cross, we can rob it of its power. We can make it to where it's, it's empty and it's void and, 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 and doesn't set the captives free and, and doesn't save the lost and, and doesn't heal the sick and, and just doesn't do what it's, what it's supposed to do. And Paul is saying here, I'm, I'm determined. I'm going to separate all the wisdom of men away from the wisdom of God. I only want what God has called here. But I'm commissioned to not only preach, but I'm commissioned to preach in a way of Christ and Him crucified that I will not rob the power of the cross and I will see the demonstration of the Spirit of Almighty God. You see, I, I think, beloved, maybe we have added too much of man's wisdom to God's wisdom. And it's so watered down, it's void of power. Hallelujah. It prior to force emptied of its power and rendered vain and fruitless. There's a wisdom that's greater than the wisdom of this world. It's the wisdom of God. And you and I can make a choice. We can walk in the wisdom of God, or we can walk in the wisdom of man. We have the opportunity to, to make that choice and decide how we live. In the wisdom of God, we see the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. In the wisdom of man, we rob that. Doesn't that seem like a no-brainer? How many of you can remember my chess steward that I always use? Nobody can remember it? Okay, then I can go through. Only Andy remembers it. <laughs> Imagine this. I like how nobody ever has any comments in me, too. If I was to play this Illinois State chess champion tomorrow, how many of you think I would beat him or her? Eli, you're my man. Yeah, Eli, the first one in, in, in 30 years that's ever raised her hand. Praise God. I've been leaving that story for all these years. And Eli said, yeah, pass her yes. <laughs> How many of you think I would beat him or her? I don't know if it's a man or woman. I don't know anything about it. Most of you think I would lose, don't you? I don't know you play. I mean, none of you have ever seen me play chess, but automatically you think I'm going down. No, I don't know. I but well, let me ask you this. I haven't heard you, uh, that you played in one. Let me ask you this. What if I sit down across the table, the state champion's there, and at my side I have a world champion? And the world champion's going to tell me each move to make. Yeah. How do you think I'm going to win that? I got it down. Don't have a chance. You're real good. I got it. Yeah. But what about this? I would never do this if it was. What about we get about 10 moves into this game and I'm watching the standings to make that good? He or she might be state champion, but they're not that good. I can play with them. Matter of fact, I think I can beat this dude. And I'm going to start ignoring the world champion and doing what moves I want to make. No, thanks for your word confidence. You better even have to get a You see, I mean, I would be foolish in that situation, though, wouldn't I? Not to listen to the world champion and make every move that he tells me or she tells me. 
I mean, why wouldn't I? I mean, if I'm playing somebody in chess and I've got the best in the world right there telling me what moves to make, why in the world would I not listen to them other than maybe my pride might rise up and get in the way? I think, well, I want credit to be this person. <laughs> you see, it's kind of that way. The reason I use that illustration is because, quite honestly, we have access to the wisdom of God. But so often we choose not to live by it because we think we can do this on our own. Wouldn't we be foolish not to make every move according to the direction of God's wisdom? Wouldn't we be foolish not to just heed every word in this book and say, well, God wrote this book and this is God's wisdom. Shouldn't I walk according to this? Excuse me, let First Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, one of the key points it's making here is that Paul is drawing that dividing line and showing us the difference between the wisdom of man, the wisdom of this world, and the wisdom of God. And goes on to share with you and I that we have access to the wisdom of God. And a lot of people take these scriptures, I think, totally and completely out of context. Go to First Corinthians chapter 2. We've been through verses 1 through 5. Let's look at verses 6 and 7. Eli gets two pieces of cake tonight, baby. Anyway, anyway. Two bowls of ice cream. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect or mature, yet not the wisdom of this world. Now, he's not coming with the wisdom of the world. Nor are the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And we keep going on, but none of the princes of this world knew for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You see, Christ and him crucified is the greatest demonstration of the wisdom of God the world's ever seen. Satan thought he had the victory. He thought he had won. He thought he had defeated the Son of God. And the very thing that he thought that he had defeated the Son of God is what spelled his eternal doom. The very th time that he thought he was defeating the Son of God is the time that the Son of God was purchasing our salvation. The very time that he thought he was defeating the Son of God, he was purchasing our healing and our deliverance and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and everything we could ever receive from Christ. He was purchasing at that moment and Satan's cheering and thinking he had won. The wisdom of this world stood and the, and the religious people stood at the foot of the cross and they mocked him. The wisdom of this world said he is defeated. The wisdom of this world made a mockery out of him. But the wisdom of God defeated hell at that very moment. And Paul is trying to draw their attention to the wisdom of God and what he had done through Christ and him crucified and trying to get them to turn away from the wisdom of this world and the ways of this world and to look unto Christ and him crucified. Keep going, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. People stop there all the time and just say, oh, well, we just can't know anything. Can't see it with our eyes, can't hear it with our ears. But verse 10 is the point. This wisdom of God, you don't see it with your eyes, you don't hear it with your ears, you don't touch it with your hands. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. You and I, beloved, we have access to the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit, the teacher, the anointing on the inside of us to teach us and lead us and guide us and instruct us. Why in the world we would want to lay that down and walk according to the wisdom of men? Why in the world would we not, like Paul, say, yes, I'm going to lay down all of this. I'm going to be determined to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. I only want to know what God's Word has to say to me. I only want to know what the Spirit of God says to me. I only want to know what it men and women have to say to me. I'm going to lay down the wisdom of this world and walk in the wisdom of God. Why in the world would we not embrace that wholeheartedly, beloved? Why would we ever want to go by our own understanding, our own knowledge, our own emotions, our own experience, or somebody else's learning? It seems so simple. You see, God's trying to share something with us. See, he's trying to hold up Christ and him crucified. So the Holy Spirit will come in with demonstration. 
and the Holy Spirit will do verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that you might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You see what that scripture is telling us here? He's laying it, he's laying it there with the wisdom of this world, and the wisdom of this world's come to naught. He's looking at the wisdom of God, Christ and Him crucified, and saying that the Holy Spirit is then going to reveal to you everything that Christ purchased when He died on the cross, was buried, resurrected, and sitting on the right hand of the Father. He sent His Holy Spirit to us with the intention of the Holy Spirit showing us the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus that He purchased when He was crucified on the cross. But we can trade that in and just walk according to the wisdom of the world if we want. Or we can rise up as God's children and walk in the fullness of what God has for us. Holy Ghost taught, Holy Spirit led, full of the Word of God, and walk in His wisdom. We can be like Paul and determined to know nothing among us but Christ and Him crucified. I don't need anything else. It's like I keep saying, as I've been focusing on this and, and teaching on this and preaching on this these last few weeks, that every time I go to prayer, the Lord just speaks to me and says, Mike, can you trust me for everything? Can you trust me for everything? Can you trust me all the time and everything? I keep going back and just reflecting on these people. I keep sharing this in people's lives like George Mueller and Hudson Taylor who, who just put themselves in a place where they had to rely on God to put food on the table the next morning for them to have something to eat. Can we trust Christ and Him crucified for everything? Can we trust the wisdom of God for everything? Can we do like Paul and say, yeah, I, I, I don't want to go that way in the world. I don't want to go with the world's wisdom, but I want to walk in God's wisdom. I want to walk in your word. I want to be led by your spirit. Do you hear what the word of God is saying to us tonight, beloved? If we walk in his wisdom, and we walk in his word, and we walk in his spirit, the end result is what Paul is talking about. is a demonstration of the power of the kingdom of God, the almighty power of God being manifest. We just walk in wisdom and just kind of hang out until we die. Until Jesus comes. That's so rich. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. We worship you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you. 